So I often ask veterans, I say, well, you know, so when you're flying into Vietnam, you know you're going to a war zone, but you don't really know it until something happens. Hey, hey, you don't know until an airplane's going to land on the landing strip is getting blown up. <laughs> were, well, were you able to but see... But you're in a bad spot. <laughs> yeah. Were you able to see out the windows as the plane... Oh, yeah, coming? you can see out the windows. And right when we soon as that plane landed, they rushed us out, put us on trucks. Then they run us up to what's called C-2. Uh, or comp, it was right, right there at uh, Dong uh, Da Nang. Yeah. Uh, outside Da Nang here, and yeah. then uh, they sent us up to uh, Dong Hall. Okay. And then Dong Hall, they put us on a chopper, and the next morning they landed me on top of a hill, which was getting bombarded at the same time or getting attacked. Was was that um, not Marble Mountain? Um, uh, no, it was up on that, what they call Mother's Ridge. What was it called? Mother's Ridge. M Mother's Ridge? Mother's Ridge, M-U-T-T-T-H-E-R. Oh, Mother's Ridge. I've never heard of that. That's that's up by the DMZ? Oh, yeah, that's up there close. Wow. You've oh. heard of the rock? The rock pile? Yep. Yeah, I've seen the rock pile a few okay, times. Okay, Dong Hall Mountain just lays aside out there. From Dong Hall Mountain, you can see the rock pile across the valley there. Oh, yeah. I know that area. You know where the chopper is up on the... The mountain ridge there, the, what I'm talking about? Yeah. That, that chopper is what we call Chopper's Point. Yeah. That's wow. where we got ambushed one time. Well, hold on, I want to come back and talk about that, but now, when you're flying into Da Nang, um, can you see the artillery going back and forth from the... Oh, from you can't see it. No, all we, all we can see was the, where they landing. We can see our landing strip. Yeah. And we can see the explosions along that landing strip. Oh my gosh. So yeah, we wow. were kind of worried about that. Wow. And I mean, is the plane just? Are the guys in the plane just dead silent? Well, we were all kind of looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> kind of looking at it, huh? Yeah, we were just looking for it. It's not going to be no fun. Oh my gosh, wow. So, from Da Nang up to Dong Ha, from Dong Ha up to Mudder's Ridge, or Mudder's, Mudder's Hill, they called it? No, it was what's called Mudder's Ridge. Mudder's Ridge. Oh, it ran for a couple of miles there, several miles. So, you're right up there on the DMZ then? Yeah. So, up there you're dealing mostly with NVA? Yeah, NVA and the VC then. Let me just mention some place names and then tell me what, what comes to mind when you hear these names. So I'll just I'll just mention several places. So Quang Tree. Quang Tree been Quang Tree. Yeah. Dong Ha. Dong Ha been there. Kan Tien. Kan Tien, I have been there. Yeah, the <laughs> the rock pile. Been there. And Kaysan. Kaysan? Well, I've been around say con uh there, but I, I never did get stationed there. I was there for a couple, you know, chop, jumping choppers. Yeah. Off one chopper onto another. Okay, at Kason. Yeah. Okay. So our like vessels had already been hit, and you know, pretty well that much wiped out. So we kind of, it was a kind of a desolate place then. Right. Yeah. When I say <sighs> Kantian, what comes to mind? <laughs> Kantian. That's when the 101st Air Cast released us off Mudder's Ridge. They pulled us off Mudder's Ridge, and because Kilo, Mike, and Lee, uh, Lima Company had already got wiped out almost, India Company, when they pulled us, we were the last ones to pull off. They sent the 101st Air Cast out. Uh, now, I'm not knocking the Army because, yeah. you know, but when we come off of there, I had two Vandaliers, one Claymore, uh, one mortar round. And my canteens plus my M16. Yeah. Uh, and I come off of there with all that, and I'd already I'd, I'd got rid of a bunch of it up there. But when I got down there, we got, they had beer piled up in these little uh, <laughs> trailer things. Man, you thought we was wanting a beer because we hadn't had seen a good beer in a long time. I mean, that, that instead of Black Label, they actually had Budweiser. <laughs> this is the army. And so. anyway. When we were we got there, the 101st aircraft come in in trucks. Yeah. And they was getting on choppers going up Butters Ridge to take our place. Yeah. And most of them had one uh, M16 and a one or two Vandaliers on. That's all they had. 
They didn't know what they were getting into, huh? Hey, they had no idea. And they were back down there, and two days later, they was back, then we went back up. Is that right? Well, they had taken a Jeep up there that's taken some stuff that you could not get around anywhere up there. Why yeah. they took it, I don't know. But anyway, they, they took a lot of stuff up there and left it. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if, if you could have talked to one of those Army guys, you know, you were there at that transition when Army takes... Because usually when we think of Northern I Corps, we think Marines, but the Army moves in, I think, in 69. Let um, them out real quick, too. <laughs> yeah. But but you, it, it, that was that was kind of an odd deal where you know, one of our guys, I went to a reunion here a few years back, yeah. and they had everything laid out that we wore. Mm. You know, they had the canteens laid out, your canteen belts, your vandaliers, your claymore, your mortar brown, your grenades, uh, all this stuff laid out. Hey, they weighed it, it weighed 100, almost 105 pounds. Mm. And wow. Uh, best I remember, I weighed 165. Wow. Yeah, I'm carrying that stuff up and down in mountains. I have no idea. Scared, I guess. Yeah. If you and if you could talk to you know, let's say you know, here you see these army guys who are getting ready to take over. If if you could talk to one of those 19, 20 year old army guys and give them a heads up about what's coming up in the, up at the DMZ, what what would you tell them at the time? We told them as they was getting on them choppers, hey boys, you ain't taking enough stuff. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, you know, I mean, obviously up in the DMZ, up in that area, you're going to see a lot of, you're going to see a lot of action up there. Well, we saw quite a bit. If, if you read, read these chronicles, it actually has day by day episodes and hour by hour. Uh, you know, when we hit something or when we didn't hit something what we found what we didn't find uh, what we looked for yeah it has a lot of stuff that you would probably find interesting yeah i'd like to see it now you 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 mentioned a few minutes ago an ambush oh and i'm there's three of those over there um yeah so i was going to say i'm guessing there's more than one um what when i just say that word when i put those two words together Kantian ambush or dmz Ambush, what what comes to mind? Uh, Leatherneck Square, or what they call Common Taylor, as over here, I guess people would call it Operation Common Taylor. We called it Leatherneck Square. Yeah. Now, and the reason it's called Leatherneck Square, or we did, is they brought Mike, Kilo, Lima, Andy, and me all in to one place there at uh, Dong Hall. Yeah. And they had, they, we, they trucked us in there, we got off. And we knew there was something up because there was big movie screens set up different spots. Hmm. And then in, they had all the beer you could drink. They had any kind of food you wanted. You could go by and pick out the steak you wanted. Yeah. The guys would cook it. You know, they would cook it for you. And we know we was getting set up for a big deal. Yeah. You know, and the next morning they told us we was going to love the next square. Yeah. But they fed us our last supper before they sent us. Uh, uh, their last supper. <laughs> yeah, they thought it was. They thought it was going to be an eighty-some odd percent casualty deal. Oh, so explain this to me. What what was going on? Well, the Vietnamese had what they call uh, this area. They was mostly jungles type stuff. Yeah. Plus, it also had a bunch of tunnels in it. Mm. So anyway, they had a big field between the jungle part and where they call the urban compound out in the field, out there. To, well, it's probably four or five hundred yards out there. Yeah. But anyway, we come in at night and got along eleven next square. My Kilo, Lima, uh, company, all, all of us got down in one big line right down the middle of that, uh, right neck into the woods just outside the field. Yeah. And you could hear the rounds going past your head that was coming from the armed compound. And the shooting was going on over there. Well, come daylight, them guys always run back to Lesnar next Square well, because they can hide easy. The Arvins. Yeah, yeah. and also regular uh, MDA. But anyway, mm. uh, when they come across there the next morning, we had them. The NBA. Uh, we had them. Yeah, anybody come across that field, we opened fire on them. And you're talking four companies 
lined up in a line. And every fourth hole had a 30 gal in it. Wow. And two parts we had a 50 gal. Yeah. Uh, when they come across that, we let them down. So what, did the NVA, they launched a frontal assault? Well, see, that's what them, uh, in the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, they would go out there and hit that thing every night. Camp Leatherneck. No, no, it wasn't or, Leather, no, Camp no, Leatherneck. No. It was just a ville they had there. That okay. an Arvin comp, they had an Arvin compound. Oh, they'd hit now, that every night, yeah. All the Arvins would come there, and that was their base. Yeah. And they would, more or less, uh, and we thought that would be a good ambush on them. Yeah. So when they come when they come to them woods the next morning, now I don't I can't tell you a lot about it because I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you the first day and what happened there. Uh, yeah. But I can't tell you it was there seven days. Yeah. Seven days of pretty much constant firefight. Well, the first day was constant. You could hear it all day long. Wow. Next day a little bit lighter. The next day a little bit lighter. The next day a little bit lighter. Yeah. In time we left, they wasn't none. Wow. How about you? I mean, did you end up, you know, I mean, did you come through unscathed yourself? No, I've got a purple heart. Do you? What What happened? Well, we uh, run into an ambush. We was going across uh, between what they call Camelot Bridge and a uh, place called C2. Mm -hmm. And it was just a place where had a bunch of elephant grass in it, you know, it was higher in your head, basically. Mm. But anyway, we was plowing through, down through that all across a big field, and they laid a trap on us. And mm -hmm. we walked right into it. Okay. Uh, so they started opened up on us. That, so the first thing you do is jump in a hole. Right. You know, and there was a big old uh, shell or a place of bomb had landed. It made a pretty good uh, hole. So that's where I jumped. Hmm. Well, the next thing I know, an RPG comes lying in there with me. Oh, gosh. And I went high enough that you could actually see the black pajamas in the R <laughs> Vietnamese out there in the elephant grass, which didn't give me a good advantage. You know, I could shoot. I was still, I had my rifle. I could still shoot. So, <laughs> so, so one, they all saw me, too. But anyway, oh we've they done, we done a lot of shooting around there. So you're saying an RPG... Uh, like a sent, grenade. Yeah, sent you airborne. Oh yeah, I was blowing blow up in the air. And when you were airborne, you you, you were able to see the Arvin and also the RV, the the NBA NBA too. But wow. anyway, time I got back to the ground, the thing that bothered me the most was that M seventy nine that we could pack with us. Mm. Yeah, I didn't like them dang things anyway, but because it always get tangled up in the jungle and root and vines and stuff, you know. Yeah. So. Anyway, they called our, uh, <coughs> called from M seventy nine up. So, well, I had one, so I went up with it. And I, I know exactly where to shoot. So, poof! Well, I got rid of that rascal. Then, uh, anyway, I went back, and then at that time I was a fire team leader, and I got you know the fire, We called in some phantoms, and they wiped them. You know, more or less cleaned the area out. So you called in the jets, and the jets came and got them. All right. Yeah. Well, we couldn't see them, basically, in that elephant grass. Now, you're saying you went full, after after the RPG blew you up, you came back down, and then you knew where they were, and so oh, yeah. you went up with your M79, and since you knew where they were, you were able to hit them. I hit where I thought they was at. I'm sorry? I hit where I thought they were at. Yeah, and they got quiet at that place? Well, no, it, it lasted a little bit longer than that. I see. Uh, then we called up. Phantoms in, they come in and they clean them out. I see, yeah. Then we cleaned up after that. And then I met a back and my guys out. And, well, there was quite a few. I forget now how many was it. I'd have to read in the deal. Yeah. But I had several guys that was wounded. <clears throat> anyway, we had them all met a back out. And we were all sitting around there just bull crap. And then one of the guys said, hey, T, they called me T over there. Yeah. Uh, I said, hey, T, you're bleeding. I said, oh, wait, wait. and I was off into the guys there. They said, no, you're bleeding, you're dripping. Uh, and I said, where? And they said, in your leg. So I looked, sure enough, I had blood running down my leg. So I called for the corpsman up. Corman come over and had me pull down my pants. He says, well, Jim, he says, uh, you got about four pieces of shrapnel 
in your hind quarters. Wow. And I said, well, gee. Uh. Uh, and, and, you know, he said, they look like scratches. He says, I don't know if there's any metal in them or not, but he says, they're scratches. That you can tell there's wounds. And he says, well, uh, and it, this is about the time of monsoon season. This is the end of July. Yeah. And July 25th was the exact day of it. And anyway. Uh, July 25th, 69? Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, uh, I told him I was all right because I didn't feel anything. Yeah. You know? And anyway, we had to go to C2. That's where we were headed. And so, anyway, we took off there and going to C2. And we run into a little bit of scuffling before we got there. But then uh, we had to cross the Camel River. We mm-hmm. had to cross it. And I guess I got an infection. Anyway, by the time I got back to C2, the... Uh, Staff told me, says, you go uh, tell your surgeon, see what, see, and have him look at you. So yeah. I did. And when I got up there, they said, medevac him. Oh, gosh. So and, they, they sent uh, you down to Da Nang then? Well, I don't remember exactly where I went. Oh. I don't, I don't remember anything past that. Now, the next time I woke up, I was in a uh, tent in uh, outside the Plain Tree. Oh, okay. And... It was a kind of a mash unit. Yeah. And I was set, I was laying on a table, and you know, <laughs> uh, these guys was, had the white clothes on and white garb. Yeah. So they was talking about amputate this guy's leg. Oh gosh. And I'm the only guy sitting there or laying there on this damn bed. So I thought, well, no, that ain't gonna happen. Oh, you thought they were talking about you? Yeah, they was talking about me. Oh, they were talking about. Oh, and I saw a butt of a M16 over there. Just underneath the curtain. That's where I went to. I got it. So anyway, I told them they wanted to go cut my leg off. And anyway, I wow. had myself enough that I told them what to tell you to cabbage. But anyway, yeah. Wait, you, hold on. You you grabbed the M16 and I, yeah, and I, said you're not cutting my leg off. I'm gonna cut my leg off. Wow. And anyway, by the time I got done, I had the MPs, the SPs, and the colonels and generals. I had everybody in there. But anyway, I told him I've got my leg off. But anyway, a colonel told me, he says he he would operate on me, and he, he would make it work. Uh, I, I could watch the whole operation. He wouldn't dead me, but no waist down. Wow. And anyway, it took him a while to convince me of that. Yeah. Uh, he did convince me, and he did put a mirror work at the foot or where I was on my belly. Right. And he put it at the end of the bed where I could see that and I could look up at the big light thing they had, which was a kind of a mirror type thing. Yeah. And I watched him cut a lot of slab off anyway. Oh gosh. But anyway they oh. couldn't get to the current or the uh colonel told me says I can't get to the metal because that metal is in you got shrapnel next to your bone. And it's underneath, it's moved its way underneath the muscle. He said, if I cut that muscle, you're going to have a limp the rest of your life. Mm. I said, well, is there any other options? He said, well, it might bleed out or move if we give it some time. I said, let's give it some time. Yeah. Uh, But anyway, they didn't actually sew it up, but they actually patched it up, and they sent me back to Wayne Tree, the headquarters. Yeah. So anyway. Wow. had to. They didn't give you a ride or nothing because there wasn't no vehicles around there unless you just you had to thumb your way back where you went. Right. So anyway, I got back to the Quang Tree headquarters there, and I remember knocking on the door to tell them who I was, and I passed out, I guess. Oh, gosh. Uh, but anyway, when next time I woke up, they had me in a cot, one of them folding tops. Yeah. And I was laying in it, and they filled it full of ice. And then they had it all closed up around me like a cocoon. And all I was sticking out there was my head. And I remember freezing to death. You know, I said, oh, yeah. what the heck is the problem here? Get me out of here. I'm freezing. But they said I had a fever of 106. Oh, God. I don't know how accurate that was. But, yeah, I undoubtedly passed out for some reason. From, from the infection? <laughs> well, that infection, jungle rot, gangrene, oh. and a few other little things wrong with it. But Wow. Then wow. they sent me to the hospital, another hospital, medevac me over, and they put me in the ch- what we call the children's hospital in Plain Tree. Wow. Now, once they'd already changed it into a uh, 
kind of a doctor or a, a hospital type thing. Yeah. But anyway, there was about 15 of us over there in that after they operated on me again, cut a bunch of that out. And I was in there for 10 days. Wow. And they, and on the 10th day, and they got the metal out. Oh, they did? Uh, well, all but four pieces. I still carry four pieces with me. Really? Uh, but anyway, wow. they had it good enough they thought I could survive. But anyway, they pulled, they put that old uh, iodine-looking stuff in it every day and yeah. put it out every night and put it back in morning and night. Wow. But anyway, they cured all the infection. And then they sewed it up let me go on 10 days later. And you were back out in the field? Well, no, they put me back in uh, bed rest back to the tent at the head or at the base of or yeah. my headquarters, which was just a tent. Yeah. And anyway, I was there for three, four days before a lieutenant come by and told me to shine my boots. Oh, gosh. I told him to kiss my butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, oh he was going to write me up. He was brand new to the country. And I said, hey, just step mm. right outside here, sir, and I'll salute you and do my boots. And mm. the rest of the guys told him not to. Mm. But uh, anyway. Golly. And, uh, I volunteered to go back to Bush the next day. And I was back up on Mother's Ridge. Really? Wow. Wow. You mentioned um, the the corpsmen. Of course, these are these are Navy guys, right? Who are with the Marines? Our corpsmen were the best in the world. Yeah, tell me, tell, tell me what you remember about the corpsmen. Well, me and Doc Muller got pretty close there at first uh, when I first got there. Yeah. June sixth, we got ambushed. Muller was behind me, and a friend of mine, Kohler, was in front of me. Both of them picked up two rounds of piece out of a thirty cal. Mm. And the same, the, the, somehow or another, they missed me because I was in between them. Oh, wow. But yeah. that was the last time I really made good friends with anybody, <laughs> you know, there. Because you, they, they come and went pretty quick over there. So let me, let me just back up a little bit then. So you've got, is it, you said Doc Miller? Uh, Mueller. Mueller. So Doc Mueller's on one side of you, and then another Marine's on the other side. Mueller was on the other side. Well, we was all going down a hill. Yeah. And uh, they opened up on us, and we had, well, was the day the dog handler got killed too. The dog handler was number one man going across, and the dog missed him somehow or another. And he walked all the way through and hit the other end of that horseshoe. And when they opened up on him, they started to close my horseshoe up, and I was at the rear of the horseshoe. Oh wow. So, I got to shoot right and left and anywhere around me. Wow. <clears throat> and so and so the, the medic and the other Marine on your other side, they they both got hit. Oh yeah. Well they come out here and wiped us all out. I think there wasn't but about uh, out of my company there wasn't but about ten or fifteen of us that wasn't hit. When what what day was this? June? June sixth. June sixth, sixty nine. When you look back on Vietnam today, what is what does all that mean to you now? Well, I was kind of teed off when I come back to the States. When I went over there, me and my buddies, we stopped. When we come out of boot camp, we went to Los Angeles, or Los Angeles down there. Yeah. And boy, we were heroes, and people bought us dinner, and bought us coffee, and this and that. And so we thought we were big, big shots, you know? Yeah. So off to Nome we go. We come back and actually, hell, I had to hitchhike all the way from Tulsa, all the way over home here. And yeah. I never even, I couldn't even pick up a ride. Really? That was in uniform. You were in uniform, yeah. You know? Wow. Uh, people just did not have the hanker for us baby killers, they called us. Oh, gosh. You're, you're saying you hitchhiked from, from California to oh, Arkansas? Oh. From I, Tulsa. I took a plane from L.A. to Tulsa, and then uh, I went and spent a night with a friend of mine there in Tulsa, and she was going to bring me home, and then she had she was called in to go to work. I told her I'd just hitchhike, it'd be no problem. Back then, we could hitchhike, no problem. Sure. Well, <laughs> that, but, I had a problem, but it, anyway, I got home that same day. But, you, but you're saying, but you had your uniform on. Uh, 
Yeah. So even even in even in Oklahoma, you felt like having the uniform at that time worked against you. Uh, pretty much so. Well, I wasn't too crazy about the uh, the way people looked at me sometimes. Yeah. Did you have any? You know, some vets. You know, I talked to a vet the other day. He said, "Look, I never had any problems. I've had other vets who said that they were spit on. I mean, how did how did things go for you?" Well, in California, they did. What did they do? Well, they they, they showed things up. They, they spit at you. You saw it. You saw that. Yeah. Oh gosh. Wow. So, I mean, when you look back on all that now, I mean, what do you what do you think about it? Well, I think. You know, I know what I've done and what my guys done. We saved you guys from communism. Yeah. If it wasn't for, been for us uh, beating the hell out of Russia there in Vietnam, them guys would have had the powerhouse over us. Hmm. I hear you. So if we hadn't beat Vietnam and uh, the Chinese and the Russians furnishing them all their stuff, we broke them. That's the reason the wall went down when Reagan got in. Yeah, over time, right, over time. So you, some people look at us it was a lost war, but no, not really. We, we won freedom for the rest, for, you know, last 30, 40 years anyway. Yeah, so you're, are you, you're saying, I mean, some people say, look, you know, what Vietnam showed, you know, to other, like, um, it showed to communist forces in other places, if you try to take over this other place, you're going to have to face what the uh, communists yes. in Vietnam had to face. No, no see, the, the, well, I hate to say this, but our, our politicians are what well, throughout that war, you know, the, the ending of the war and up the war. Yeah. Well, we could have won the thing several times, but when I first got over there, we were pretty free to do, you know, what the Marine Corps wanted us to do. Yeah. But then they started putting in safe zones. Like, uh, for example, Holloway that, that got accused of killing the Ville. Yeah. Uh, hey, them, that Ville, <laughs> I was over there at a place that had a Ville from it. We'd catch mortars from them every night. From one of those secure zones? Yeah. Yeah, so... But we couldn't go in there to shoot, and we couldn't shoot back either. Right, so I hear this a lot, and so let me let me ask you this, because I, I was talking to another Marine who was at Concierge in 67, and he, he said that um, they would sometimes get artillery from the northern side of the DMZ, Yeah. but that they weren't allowed to fire back. Right. Is that right? That's right. That's crazy. <laughs> it it <laughs> seemed like that to us, yeah. yeah. I started having dreams back then. In '03 or '04, somewhere back. In yeah. There. So, what, what, why do you think? I mean, because you're out of Vietnam in '69. Why do you think it, it wasn't until '03 that you started having the dreams? And well, stuff? as a psychiatrist told me, she said a brain is kind of like a file cabinet, and through life you're filling up your file cabinet. Yeah. Well, you get tight, ready to retire. Exactly. And your mind gets a little bit slow, and you, you're slowing down. You're not as busy. Exactly. So. That's what it. mine does is go back there and start opening up these old files. That's it. And it opens up the wrong files, I believe. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly it. Because, you know, I've been, um, I've been interviewing combat veterans for over 20 years now. And, I, and you know, I, 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 think that, I think that what you're saying is right, that when vets get to about retirement age, you know, that's when a lot of them start spending more time thinking about their combat experiences and things like that. And another thing, you know, in 05, you know, I was telling you about the ambush that Cole and Muller got killed. Yeah. Well, uh, I was guarding the upper part of this hill, and these guys that was at the bottom of the hill was trying to get past me because if they get past me, they'd be safe. Yeah. Okay, well, here comes this old big red-headed kid, you know him? I mean, he was really huffing and puffing coming up that hill. Yeah. And I was uh, shooting both sides and throwing grenades and this and that. And finally, he made it past me, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, you know, and he ran past me, and I noticed him uh, real good then. He yeah. had a round through his shoulder. Oh, gosh. And his uh, shoulder blade was, what well, it sounded like a bag of barbels. Hmm. And his leg did not have any muscle on it at all. I could see his bone from top of his ankle all the way up to his knee. Oh my gosh. 
and he got past me, and then he got up where the other guys were, and then he laid down, and he passed out. Wow. Well, uh, I thought he, did, he was dead anyway, you know, because he looked bad enough when he come by me. Yeah. But I met him in 05. Really? Yep. Wow. Uh, I was telling one of the other guys about, you know, that same deal. Yeah. He was in a different spot than I was. And I told him, I always wanted one of that little red kid. And wow. we were still going our albums, you know, and we were looking at our pictures and stuff. Sure. And a bunch of old guys sitting around the table. And oh, wow. And the one says, I saw him, the last time I saw him, he was coming up there past me. And I couldn't think of his name. Yeah. And they said, well, that's old Marvel. And I said, Marvel who? He's said, sitting right over there. Wow. So I went over to that fork and stuff. I looked at him, he looked at me, and mm. we remembered. Wow. Never had that dream since. I was burning this brush bomb, and I took a whiff, and I smelt napalm. Oh, gosh, yeah. The burning flash, you know. I, mm. Yeah, and if you've ever smelt it, you'll know exactly what, you know, you know it, you'll know it forever. And I was looking around his brush ball because I knew something had crawled in there and something had died. Oh. And she hollered at me and hollered at me. Finally, she came out there and got me. And I, she asked me what I was doing. I told her, I guess she thought I was nuts. Yeah. But anyway. Wow. I didn't pay any more attention to that. But, you know, you, uh, you have dreams that would come back at you or instances. Mm. That, you know, you just let, you know, you follow them back in your file cabinet and forget about them. So you're you're saying this one time, um, you're you're burning some brush in the backyard, and something got into the brush and had died and, and was burning, and you smelled that burning. There wasn't nothing in the brush. Oh, there wasn't. No, it was all in my mind. All in your mind. You smelled napalm, and you smelled it was burning. In my mind, it was the fire itself, I guess. The fire and the burning flesh and the napalm. Yeah, and all I was doing was burning brush. What about if you're just what about if you're just out in your yard and then all of a sudden you hear a you hear a helicopter? <laughs> I look for a Huey. Yeah. I, I can just still tell the difference between a Huey and the others. The Chinook. Yep. Yeah. So really you you, you hear a Hilo and not and you're you're back in Nam again? No. Not unless it's a Huey. Okay. I hear that. Wow. If you've been on a Huey and been dumped out of it in the middle of the night, you remember the sight of the sound of a Huey. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Are there anything, any other, any other things that will, you know, that will just bring you back? You know, if you. Oh, I haven't been. I haven't. I haven't had a memory of Norm in, in years, years or now. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, I pretty much got to where I talked to the guys. You know, and, yeah. and a lot. It all. Every time I talk to the reunion guys. I lose a little bit, you know, or the the stuff that was worse because some of them had worse. Yeah. Uh, so you're saying it. You're saying that you know, because there are a lot of vets who just don't want to talk. But it sounds like you're saying that you know, talking and sharing and doing that that it's it's helpful. People that know what you're doing. Yeah. You know, when I, that's the advantage I had. Where some of them don't have. Where I got together with a bunch of little boys that I was with. Yeah. They know what I done. They know what I know what they done. Yeah. Uh, we knew that we wanted to listen to tall tales. Now it's like mm. like I used to work at the National Cemetery. Yeah. And it wasn't unusual to have somebody come by. You know, and they want to tell you about their soldier experiences. You know, right? And this that. And there's it got to where you could pick the guys that was telling you a bunch of crap. <laughs> and some that wasn't. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you could. You, you can detect them pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And I found out a lot of guys, uh, you know, steal memories and stuff from uh, vets. And yeah. They they put themselves in that place. So yeah, it kind of dulls your sense for by the people where you know. I hear you. Tell you some of the damn stuff. Yeah. So it's it's important to talk, but to talk to people who and know what who, you're talking about. Know.